My name is Isabel Yenichus. I'm with the New Mexico Healthy Soil Working Group. And um, yeah, I will talk about, of course, healthy soil. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm uh, gonna start with my favorite Wendell Berry quote here, be joyful though you have considered all the facts because um, some of the facts today are, are difficult. Um, this shows a dust storm, which unfortunately we do have dust storms again um, that are sometimes deadly as a recent one with a, with a pileup uh, along a highway. Um, but even if they're not deadly, they're still really bad. So uh, topsoil blowing away and um, there's relatively little conversation about the root causes of, of those dust storms, which is a degradation of soil health because as um, we've already heard a lot about today, all the uh, all the animals and all the life in the soil is really helping on keeping it together uh, instead of creating dust that blows in the wind. So that is just one of the difficult facts to consider. Um, I, I do think this whole course instills a, a sense of joy though, uh, and exploration and curiosity about things that we usually can't see. A lot of the uh, critters in the soil are so small that they're difficult to comprehend. And uh, so it's, it's a real treat to spend a morning um, thinking about them, learning about them. And I'm, I'm also really impressed by um, all the people who are on this webinar today, just going through the answers in the chat and what you already are bringing to the table in knowledge and uh, in practice. So it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to be here. So I'm gonna start off with um, some uh, conversation about soil health policy uh, by request. <laughs> this is not usually what I talk too much about, although this is actually how um, the soil health, uh, the New Mexico Healthy Soil Working Group got started. So um, taking a step back and really thinking about uh, terminology with policy, this was actually pretty interesting for me to look up. So we say soil health policy, we actually mean something that is uh, quite broad. It's, it's a system of guidelines to guide our decision and um, in an attempt to achieve certain outcomes. So these are actually not rules of law. Um, it is, it is a, the overarching uh, system. Then we have laws, which is that set of rules. Um, they're usually enforceable by a government or an institution and the idea is to regulate behavior. Then we have legislation and that is the process or the result of enacting and declaring those law, these laws um, and it's usually done by a legislature or a governing body. And so this is one thing that we did here in New Mexico and I will talk a little more about that later. Uh, we did uh, write a law, <laughs> we did write legislation um, and uh, that is something that um, anybody can do actually, which might be surprising. I thought you needed a law degree for that, but you don't, you don't have to be an attorney. Um, a lot of that was copy paste in, in our case, um, which is a good way to go, but you can also be quite inventive. Then I will talk about incentives and uh, you know, you're probably familiar with that on the consumer level, you know, it's a, a a tool to try to do, uh, influence you to do something, influence desired behavior or action. Uh, in governments, um, you know, it's, it's often voluntary, but the idea is to, um, to try to uh, influence behavior without regulating it, without um, you know, putting like a heavy thumb on something, but it's, it's the carriage approach, right? An incentive program is, I will talk about that. It's like, that is the formal scheme uh, used to encourage the specific action um, in a defined period of time. So those are just, uh, so we are all on the same page about what I will talk about next. So when we were preparing this webinar, uh, Stephanie asked me, so how did you get to um, be in this role of, um, you know, uh, a soil health advocate? and an advocate in government and, and writing legislation and all that. And uh, so this goes way back. I, and I think there's a couple of people from California on this webinar. Um, this was 2005. 
and I was part of a huge uh, community outreach, community action, groundswell, protesting and ultimately stopping <laughs> uh, the plan to aerially sp spray cities along the coast of California for the light brown apple moth. moth. And this is the little critter here, the light brown apple moth. It was you know, declared an invasive species and the spraying um, was scheduled like quite frequently uh, from the air in airplanes and um, ultimately carried out only a couple of times because it quite quickly became clear that especially vulnerable populations um, had experienced some health effects and there was also um, some effects in, in the waterways and also for animals. And so there was a huge groundswell of um, opposition. And so that's, that's how I got involved. Um, actually the spray in question, um, it was a pheromone and I think uh, Stephanie mentioned it just a couple slides back about pheromone traps. So it's used in that sense in organic farming you know, as a trap or a little spray in orchards. So by itself, it might not have been toxic or difficult or anything like that. That is the active ingredients, but then there's a lot of inactive ingredients in pesticides that typically are not disclosed. And so that was a problem. We didn't know what was in it, what actually might cause those adverse effects. And um, often they are actually hormone disruptors, which it's linked to carcinogens. Also in this particular case, it was a micro capsule. So a very, very small plasticky capsule that might've been lodged forever in the lungs. And it was so small that you can't expel it. So, you know, we never really knew why there was these adverse effects and that was very troubling. Um, so uh, just wanted to point out, these were our yard signs. Stop the spray was our group. There was, 80 groups that sprung up or chimed in. And um, we had the slogan, we see the demand safe alternatives, alternatives to aerial spraying, support sustainable farming. So already there, we were really looking at alternatives. Like, you know, we, we had this feeling like this is not necessary, right? For one thing, it wasn't proven that these moths are a real threat. As far as I know, they're still around. And haven't uh, you know uh, <laughs> destroyed the agricultural industry in California, but then also we were like, you know, this is just like we don't need to do this this way, and ultimately, ultimately uh, we won, <laughs> which is quite amazing. If anybody has tried to stop um, pesticide uh, applications or especially aerial spraying, that is very difficult. But there was such a huge outcry. It went all the way to, I mean, I was revisiting this for this talk. Uh, it was went all the way to Nancy Pelosi. People really got involved from the very bottom to the top. And so here you can see all the, all the happy headlines. <laughs> it was actually discontinued. And so as part of this effort, um, we, uh, we interacted quite a bit with governments on all levels from uh, the city council to, like I said, the federal level. Um, and there was um, several pieces of legislation introduced and some of them written by our group. So that's how I first learned that in a democracy, yeah, you could actually participate in this way. That if you think the laws are inadequate, you can make a better suggestion. And of course you do need a champion, an official champion who takes that on and brings it into the legislature and then it goes through the official channels and you know has to work itself through the um, process that is developed. But um, writing a bill, having first having that idea, having that special experience, then having that idea on how to fix something or make it better, or if something is missing, how to add it, and then writing a law about that, that can be anybody's task. And honestly, I think we should do that more often. In this particular county was actually a little phony little contest that said there ought to be a law. And you could, once a year, you could 
uh, write in ideas and that legislator might pick one out and, and actually introduce it. But in this case, we just um, took it upon ourselves to um, write certain bill proposals. We found champions, only two of them passed because it's very, very difficult in California to pass pesticide legislation, just given the, you know, the importance and the power of the um, agricultural industry. Um, and so it, it was, in my, in my estimation, not terribly important, impactful legislation that actually passed. It had more to do with, you know, notification after you spray that a sort of process has to be followed. It wasn't anything like what we had in mind, like actually stopping aerial spraying over cities or something like that. But it got me going on the on the legislation policy track. And um, you know, it's exhilarating. It's exhilarating to be participating in the in the democratic process. It's really cool to have people come out and fill the um, the legislative bodies with, with actual people, you know, and whether you protest or not, I mean, that is, it's not secondary, but it, it you know, that actually was a piece that was difficult because it was born out of a negative feeling and it was very hard to um, not burn out on that. So after that experience, I knew I wanted to continue in that place but I didn't want to continue necessarily by protesting, by being against something. I really wanted to be for something. So I, like I said already, the yard signs were pointing out the alternatives. And so that is, became very clear, like, okay, I wanna put my energy into demonstrating, promoting, helping people find and implement these alternatives, you know, the, the better way, right? So that we don't even need the chemicals that may be harmful to us and to the environment. And so I um, actually worked for six years for the Ecological Farming Association, which is a founding member of the California Climate and Agriculture Network, um, which you know you see um, some of us here. And uh, part of that, as part of that, I learned about California's Healthy Soils Program. At the time, it was really the only one out there. Uh, like I said in my little glossary, so the program is an incentive program. It helps farmers and ranchers to implement some of these alternative uh, management practices, and they can get funding for that, also for demonstration uh, projects and, and that kind of thing. It goes through, you know, an application process and, and all that. So that's how I learned about the Healthy Soil Program. And when I moved to New Mexico in 2018, I thought, oh, this is, would be kind of cool to try to um, uh, introduce here. And so with my prior uh, experience of writing a bill, I sat down one morning and wrote a bill for New Mexico. Like I said, it was a lot of copy paste. I looked at a couple other states, not just California, uh, Hawaii, I think it was Maryland. So, um, you know, taking, uh, from different sources. And then also um, I had some co uh, cooperators, of course, collaborators that were local. Uh, and we together, you know, we looked at, okay, what should be in this bill? And then, you know, we, we, we wrote that in. <laughs> so um, we assembled a huge coalition. We did stakeholder surveys. And uh, as a result of that, at the end of 2018, within a few months of my arrival, really, it was quite imagine, uh, amazing. The Healthy Soil Act was actually introduced in um, the New Mexico legislature. And we are a small state in terms of people and we have only uh, one or two months respectively in the winter as our legislative session. So all of this was going really fast, <laughs> which was pretty, pretty cool. So in uh, 2019 and in the spring, it did indeed pass. Um, there was a lot of support for it. There was a, a few mostly misguided opposition um, legislators, but um, ultimately it was signed into law and uh, the New Mexico Department of Agriculture um, did a successful 
first round, first pilot program for this incentive program. And I have another slide that uh, details what that actually means coming up. Then just going through the, the years, I mean, that was definitely the most exciting part of uh, working in policy so far, but then comes the implementation, which honestly is just as important. It may not be as glamorous, but is definitely important to stick with it. As a stakeholder, we're trying to advise the Department of Ag and, you know, from our perspective, how could it be better? Because we are really working with the people on the ground well, they might be a little bit more removed from that. So, um, you know, recurring funding was actually re uh, secured. So recurring means like every year it, uh, it is added automatically, which is, which is huge. Usually you have to, but you still have to kind of uh, advocate for it every year to make sure that that actually happens. And as the case in California, you Californians know that perhaps there can be huge fluctuation in the allocation of money depending on what's available in the budget in the state budget and so we tried to avoid that we really worked towards recurring funding making it stable and um, one way that we tried to also add to the pot <laughs> if you wish was to um, pass the healthy soil tax refund contribution option which is kind of a um, a program here in New Mexico where taxpayers can check a box that says, oh, you know, I want X amount of my refund. If you get, you know, if you're lucky to get a refund from your taxes, I want that instead of going to my own pocket, I don't need it, it should go to a good cause. So we added on the Healthy Soil program to that list of already, they have like 18 good causes. So now the Healthy Soil program is part of that. It doesn't bring in a huge amount of money, but a little bit every year, which is really nice. And it also adds to promoting the program. You know, more people know about it, which is really important because it's new. You know, people don't know about it. Then the next year we had uh, another pot we accessed through an initiative that was, you know, statewide, the Food, Farm and Hunger Initiative. There was the link between um, you know, regenerative farming, soil health, and food and hunger mitigation. So we, we worked very closely again with a huge coalition so that, um, that secured the million dollar funding that we needed that year. And then this year, actually a huge step was taken. Again, we partnered with lots of groups on this Land of Enchantment Legacy Fund um, that supports a suite of environmental and conservation programs in New Mexico and amongst them, the Healthy Soil Program. So with that, um, hopefully, like it says, permanent funding, I mean, and there's actually no other Healthy Soil Program that has permanent funding that is uh, buffered from those swings in budget. So hopefully this will pan out and every year there will be these mil at least a million dollars for the Healthy Soil Program to be distributed to people on the ground, to farmers and ranchers on the ground. That is the, the timeline uh, of the Healthy Soil Program, of the Healthy Soil Act and initiative in New Mexico. And what does the program actually do? So it is, like I said, administered by the Department of Agriculture. So they had to definitely be on board and they are, which it's been really cool to see. Um, it provides voluntary incentives um, and also education to advance soil stewardship. Um, it, it does uh, include a little wrinkle here because the state can't pay individuals directly. So they have to go through what's called an eligible entity. That's not usually the case. It's kind of antiquated, <laughs> one of those New Mexico things. Um, it does have an equity clause because that is a real problem with a lot of government programs that uh, small farmers, um, young producers, and um, so so-called socially disadvantaged communities are often um, not receiving their fair share. So we, we had um, the equity clause in there in, in an effort to uh, righten that wrong. And it is based on the five soil health principles. And we already heard today about four of them. 
Uh, I will actually talk about six, <laughs> so just to confuse everybody, but it's all the same, basically, whether you, you know, cut the cake into four or five or six pieces, it doesn't really matter. And we'll hear more about those principles later, but why that is important, we didn't want to put specific practices into the bill because A, those could change, you know, with new technology, with new research. Also, it's very difficult to be comprehensive. I mean, there's a lot we don't know. And then uh, there was also a lot of pushback from, uh, you know, farmers, honestly, also for, if you say no till, you know, there's a whole bunch of emotions that come up for good reason. <laughs> and we didn't, we didn't want to go there. And you don't actually have to, because when you have principles, they are applicable also in a much broader way to all situations. We have so many different ecosystems in New Mexico that it would have been really difficult to come up with management practices that would be applicable to all areas. You know, <laughs> if, I would say it's impossible. So it looks different on the ground than, than uh, here than over there. So with a principle, you just stick to the overarching um, guideline that applies everywhere. And then how that's applied actually is left to the individual farmer rancher, gives them some agency and actually acknowledges that they may know best. So that's how we structured it. And I don't know that there's any other law out there that uh, is based on the principles. So this is zooming out. Um, I actually don't have a map from 2018 when there was no New Mexico Healthy Soil Act, but basically this map shows all the healthy soil policy in the US that's underway or passed. So when we started, there really was only California, Utah, and Oklahoma who had some form of soil health policy. It's not always a program, an incentive program, but it may be some other vehicle that has been you know, used to um, advance soil health. Um, and then you can see now, this is really very recent, how much has changed, how many states have actually put on the books, passed, healthy soil policy, but there's, there's a huge sea change. I don't know if I can go back. Yes, okay. If you look at this and it's just a few years, this has so much changed and that's so um, encouraging and shows a really important trend in agriculture, a really needed trend to you know, um, counteract the, you know, the soil loss and pollution problems that come with um, business as usual. This is a really interesting website that I sourced this from. I actually help uh, maintaining it. Um, if you go there, if you are a real policy wonk, you will greatly enjoy it because it gives the, uh, the actual laws that are passed there and shows the framework with lots of links and language. And I mean, you could spend hours on this and, and really get ideas for what to do in your own state, perhaps if you feel so inclined. Um, so Stephanie also asked me, you know, talk about the skills that are needed to make a difference in policy. And I think, like I said, it's really not hard to write a bill. Anybody can do it. You just need to make those connections to a champion. So you need to find somebody in the legislature that understands what you want to do, that is a like-minded person or somebody that you can educate in that regard. And usually you have to be a little bit of the both, you know, not, you might not find somebody who knows everything already that you're trying to do. But then also really what is needed is persistence. Um, I partnered with a lot of people, of course. Um, one of them is my close uh, uh, co-founder of the Healthy Soil Work Working Group, Rob Hirsch, and he's very persistent. So he, you know, spent a lot of hours in uh, the Roundhouse, which is our uh, legislative house here, our state house, and he just waited outside of conference rooms for legislators to come out. Uh, to get their endorsement, um, 
and, and he did not uh, let up until it was done. So that is a pretty good skill to have. Um, also, you have to build coalitions. You have to make sure that this is actually something that comes from the, from the bottom up that is supported by the community that is needed and not just your own you know, wild idea. And so that is a really good skill to have, like basically a community organizer, which is, you know, that was that was kind of my part in, in all that, you know, getting people together, um, gathering, uh, writing letters, having maybe a petition, but also gathering input, getting feedback, having a survey, all of that. So I think, um, with that, yes, yeah, Stephanie was asking what actions could the audience take? So if you're interested in soil health policy, I would say um, go to this website and, and, and reach out to us and maybe we could connect you with some other people in your state that are also doing this work or interested in that. Go to the website and look at what's already out there. Maybe there's something that speaks to you that you think, oh yeah, that could work in our state. We should do that and then you know, take it from there. <laughs> Okay, so I will take a giant state, uh, step back um, and really focus on my favorite subject, soil. <laughs> uh, some of that might be a little repetition, but uh, I guess we learn best by repetition. Um, so, and, and I just wanna say, I can't see the chat. So if you have any questions, you may just type them into the Q&A or in the chat and we'll get to it. Afterwards, I hope to stop um, in time for, uh, for a couple of questions. And I think I can do this part pretty quickly because we've heard a lot of it already. So what is soil? Um, this is just a pie chart to show, which I think is pretty incredible, that really half of what we call soil, I mean, for, for first of all, soil is kind of a composite, a composite is not just one thing, one, you know, one kind of matter, but it half of it is really negative space, which is like water and air. And um, then you have soil organic matter and the minerals, but that negative space is super important for all the soil organisms that we learned so much about today already. So a lot of them are, are aquatic organisms, live in water, but they also need air. And then they need food, which that's where the um, organic matter and the minerals come in. So in that sense, they actually quite, similar to us in that they need food, shelter, which is what they build in the soil um, and water in the air. So what is healthy soil then? Um, it's really an ecosystem, a vital living e ecosystem um, that is the basis for the health of plants, animals, and humans. And uh, I love this picture because it's so intricate. You've seen a lot of that today already. So really healthy soil is full of life. And only life, it's only something that's alive can actually have health. And that's a really important piece to remember too. The other aspect that's really important is um, healthy soil fixes carbon. And you know, the, I'll show you a little bit how that works, but why is that important? Well, of course, right now we have an overabundance of carbon in the atmosphere where it causes uh, climate change, greenhouse effect, uh, whereas when it's in the soil, it's actually beneficial. So, you know, carbon in itself is not bad, but it's just like it's misplaced. And uh, plants and soil animals can help us putting it back into the soil. And so that is, um, you know, a very hopeful fact that is not often mentioned, although it gets more and more recognition in the environmental uh, community. Um, and it is something that we all can participate in. We can all help with that, which, you know, when, when does that ever happen? You know, something as huge as climate change, we often, most often we feel very um, powerless about it for good reason. So why is it important actually to think about soil and um, climate change? Um, whether or not you believe in climate change or whether or not that, that is something that, that you adhere to or that, that speaks to you, 
I think, um, I mean, I know from my work with farmers that some of, some of them really don't use that word or wouldn't say it that way, um, but they all see the effects of, you know, more extreme weather. I mean, that is just undisputed. And, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we think it's climate change that's man-made or if we think that's climate change that is just part of the cycle of the, um, the earth. Uh, the fact is it's happening. So the fact is also that science has shown that emissions from agriculture and emissions in general from, um, uh, from man-made systems um, do contribute to that. So, I mean, there's just really no more dispute about that. So if we are looking at um, where do these emissions come from, depending on how you slice it, it's anywhere from 10% to a quarter of all emissions come from agriculture. So it depends if you um, factor in transportation of food and, and, and also processing, but that is a huge amount. Um, and again, the good news here is we can change it because within that huge amount, there is about the, the largest source of emissions comes from agricultural soil management, which is, I think when I first saw this, I thought it was really surprising. And again, management is something we have agency in, we can change. So how does it actually work? Just really quickly is basically photosynthesis. So the CO2 in the atmosphere gets breathed in by a plant and this is a tree, but it can really be any, anything green and living, any living plant. It gets taken up into the body of the plant. Some of it gets converted to sugars as nourishment for the plant. And then some of that gets um, uh, stored in the soil. And how that works is it gets ex uh, ex uh, exuded through the root system where it attracts soil organism. And um, what happens is a big exchange takes place. So the plant exudes these, um, these sugars and in exchange, the soil organism bring, for example, minerals or other, um, other nutrients that they uh, can make available. They might be otherwise unavailable to the plant. Um, so that's how the big exchange works. And in the process of that, some of that carbon gets stored in the soil um, and, and locked up. So it, it doesn't actually go back into the atmosphere. Some of it goes back into the atmosphere too. So it's not like a totally tight loop, but um, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's a good working exchange, then um, we, we have um, the bottom line is there's some of it that gets stored in the soil. So that's just uh, really quickly about uh, the big exchange and how carbon from the atmosphere gets into the soil. And it's it's very surprising if you look at where the carbon is, um, really most of it is in the soil, in the pedosphere. And a lot of that has been uh, removed since the indus industrial revolution. And um, usually through uh, agricultural practices, such as you already heard today, tillage, um, for, for example. Now, something that's maybe less known is the sometimes called the small water cycle. Um, so what we really wanna build is a, a soil carbon sponge. So again, those, um, those pore spaces where soil organisms can live, they're also really helpful in uh, letting the water infiltrate. And this is very, very important because so many of us are now dealing with drought. And so the little bit of rain that you do get, you do want it to infiltrate and not just wash off. And then um, as, you, as you grow more greenery with that, you start a positive feedback effect, which is the biotic pump, um, which enables more rainfall actually locally, uh, instead of um, creating the greenhouse effect, which is you know, a, a negative feedback effect. So that is a lot less known. Um, if you're interested in that, we have some information on our website about this, because again, it's a hopeful story. We always hear, oh, you can't make it rain, but actually you can influence the local climate quite a bit. You can um, 
you can uh, lower the, the temperature with these local um, management decisions. And you can even, if you have a, a larger area, so the cutoff point is roughly 250,000 acres that you have you know, good vegetation cover, um, you can change um, the local rainfall even, which you know that is harder to do, but you know what? It doesn't feel so impossible. It doesn't have to be contiguous either. It can be a patchwork of areas. So the, again, this is where vegetation comes in and it's really, really important to have those live plants to actually help us with our climate. Okay, so we are returning to um, the soil health principles. And I'll go through these quickly because you already learned a lot about those. Um, there are six of those because we added know your context in the Soil Health Act here in New Mexico, there's actually just five. <laughs> you know, that was before we added context, but you know, all good. Context is actually super important because every place is unique and you know has its own history its own strengths and vulnerabilities and you really need to understand the context of the land the inhabitant the history all of that is going to be central to being a good caretaker and um, it will tell you how to apply the rest of the healthy soil principles so the first principle is really keep soil covered and especially here in um, the Southwest, I think that is the most important principle of all. Why, why is it really important? Well, really, if you think about nature, and this is what we're striving to do with this sort of alternative way of management is to farm or garden or live in nature's image. You know? So in nature, bare soil is, is almost not found. Um, and cover is really critical to protecting the soil from wind erosion, which is huge here and goes back to you know my picture of the of the sandstorm. It um, again, I mean, this is what you learned today, right? It's like a habitat for micro and macroorganisms, and it buffers soil temperature, which is really important with our rising temperatures. It also cuts down on evaporation, again making the most of our scarce water resources, and um, how do you do this though, right? So I will have a few examples per, um, per principle, but again, you can, you can imagine lots more. This is just how to apply it in one, one way. The best way really is to grow a living cover so that you have this continued exchange with the plants. And you know, that is really the best way to ensure a healthy biology in the ground. This is a wonderful, um, so suburban farm in Albuquerque, which you, could, you can't even see soil there. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> like bare soil, it's all covered, right? An abundance of, um, of plants. Now, if you, if you have uh, the need for mulching, that is kind of the second best option. And a lot of little critters find uh, refuge there, such as those ladybugs here. Um, you know, butterflies might, it holds in moisture, so butterflies might sip a little drink there. And of course, if you um, pull it away, you, you will see the moisture and you will see the, um, the positive effects. Though there is, a, there is an exception to this rule, and that is, of course, some of the, um, for example, ground nesting bees need bare ground to find nest. I personally leave a little area in the garden for them, but on the other hand, there is so much bare ground around. Unfortunately, I don't think they will have trouble finding any, but you know, there's, a, there's no, how you say, there's no hard rules ever in nature, I suppose. Uh, minimize disturbance is something that Stephanie already mentioned. Um, External inputs uh, that is in the in the Healthy Soil Act because it, it really goes back to something that we, we're really stressing is also the economic advantage of healthy soil practices and applying these principles on the farm. It's, it's actually good for your pocketbook. So if you don't have to purchase all these expensive chemicals, but instead you are growing your soil, let the plants do the work basically. 
and the soil biology will do the work, then uh, it can it can pan out. It might take usually, you know, the rule of thumb is like three years of transitioning. And this is where the incentive program comes in. It can help you with that or other programs, you know, there's other ways to find that money. But um, after that, it's usually um, either even or better for your pocketbook. Um, so yeah, what Stephanie said earlier, avoid both physical and chemical disturbance as much as possible. Um, so tillage really can destroy soil structure. Uh, it you know destroys earthworm uh, burrows and uh, especially for mycorrhizal fungi, they have these long strands. We haven't talked about them so much today, but that's another really important aspect of soil health. They get um, you know chopped up. So um, no-till is really an old practice. You see here the Pueblo farming project. These were no-till digging sticks that were used by the Pueblo communities here in New Mexico and still are actually. Um, so this is not a new thought. It's just something that we have to return to and, and wrap our minds uh, around. Um, it says minimize because they are definitely um, ways to reduce the harm to the soil while still you know, maybe getting rid of unwanted weeds or something like that. So if you don't go quite as deep or if you don't you know, turn it upside down, all of that is already a huge improvement. So again, there are no like super hard rules, but you know, do what you can, right? Do your best. That's, that's a really good start. Um, Yes, what else do I have here? Yeah. Okay, then the chemical disturbance, Stephanie already talked about that. And of course, um, that is something that, that I know more about than I want to because of my background in the pesticide um, uh, area that um, started this whole career, if you wish. Um, there's a really interesting article that came out or paper that came out a couple years ago that I've linked to in the e-resources that was a meta study that looked at about 400 studies that concern themselves with the effect on pesticides on soil organisms. And that is usually not considered at all. So this was a fantastic meta study and they found uh, significant harm uh, it, to soil organisms from pesticides, anything from, you know, death to just being, um, you know, influencing growth ne negatively. So there's definitely um, a, a harm that's done to the soil biology when we apply pesticides. And that is usually not considered at all by uh, EPA when they rank pesticides or when they you know, test pesticides, they use honeybees as an insect, which honeybees don't spend any of their time in the soil. They're not ground nesting or anything like that. So they wouldn't be a good indicator at all. So that was very interesting. And I would encourage you to read that article if you're interested. Okay, so an exception to minimizing inputs may be to use compost because compost is really important in this type of agriculture. Um, it provides cover, maybe you can use it as mulch. It also has organic matter, which is food for soil biology. Um, and actually it does kind of boost the soil life by introducing soil biology that's already in the compost. So compost, again, maybe the exception to the rule. So then you get uh, the third principle, which is maximize biodiversity. So basically uh, you want as much biodiversity above ground to have a lot of bio biodiversity below ground because every plant is associated with some specific soil biology. So although we may not be able to see them by having this above ground biodiversity, we can be quite assured that it's also below ground and um, cover crops are a wonderful tool for that. Usually they're multi-species, as we already heard today. Um, and uh, they're often, if you can let them flower, they're often wonderful also for pollinators. And they do all many, so many good things for the soil that I mean, in terms of water and uh, fertility, I mean, that's um, a really good tool. 
And plant grazing is another really good tool um, that maybe you don't think about in first when you think about um, diversity, but it can actually um, uh, increase the diversity of grasses and forbs in a, in a pasture. Um, the, the principle of plant grazing is basically to, again, mimic nature's. We used to have big herds of buffalo or other ungulates coming through being you know, in bunches because they were maybe chased by predators or were afraid of predators you know, sticking together. And then they kept moving. So they would not just stick around in a piece of pasture as um, cows mainly do today because you know they have the fence around them. Um, the fences are often too far away so they can just go wherever they want. And of course they just eat the ice cream like we all do and over graze certain grasses while leaving others untouched. And so over time you get overgrazing and you get some maybe undesirable species. Whereas if you keep animals together by making smaller pastures and herding them or otherwise moving them frequently, you can really much more be much better mimic the natural way that uh, animals have moved through the landscape, which is very beneficial. And of course, they fertilize as they go and uh, they leave little divots in the ground where, where rain can collect and seeds can collect. So they do a huge um, service to the landscape. And uh, I, honestly, it, they don't re, um, deserve the bad rap <laughs> that, that they have a lot this, these days. You know, it's, we have a saying that goes, it's not the cow, it's the how. So how you manage your animals really makes a huge difference for the environment. The living roots already were a little bit discussed today. Why are they so important? Well, because soil organisms are clustered around the roots and it provides them with food, the basic food source, the carbon, right? So that's where it all happens. So of course we wanna keep those in the soil for as long as possible throughout the whole year, if at all possible. A lot of the farming these days just happens in certain seasons and then there's a fallow area uh, period so like the bare ground period so that really is detrimental to the soil life um so how again how do you do that well perennials are a really good way to do it um orchards are wonderful and of course orchards are often uh, very uh, wonderful areas for for pollinators as well um, there are other perennials such as hedgerows, which you know really should do a comeback, need a comeback. I was kind of stoked to see that there's even a butterfly that's called the hedgerow hair streak, and it lives here in New Mexico. So that says a lot about habitat that is possible in hedgerows. Uh, you can also do uh, keep soil and uh, keep roots in the ground by means of crop rotation or again, using cover crops. And those are just some examples. Integrate animals is the sixth principle. And uh, you know, really in, in nature and also in farms, you know, not so long ago, animals were always part of farming, but now we have it separated. So it's a quite an un, unnatural uh, separation. Um, so I have some examples of animals <laughs> that are good for the soil or you know that that you should consider which of course is wildlife you know um, they do the same as uh, ungulates have done uh, forever which is you know moving through eating fertilizing um, and healthy ecosystem supports uh, animals large and small you have you know you, we can mimic this again with um, ungulates such as cattle but also with goats with sheep this is actually in the in Santa Fe where I live um, in the city. So, you know, it doesn't have to be large open space. You know, pigs are wonderful. Again, they provide other services than other species. Poultry, again, they, you know, you have these systems where one species follows another. For example, poultry that are pasture raised, they can pick out um, um, you know, bugs or um, parasites out of the, the droppings from what, animal came before them. So if you have cattle first and then poultry, that can be very beneficial. Um, of course you have pollinators. We have already heard so much about that today. 
uh, earthworms are the stars of soil health. And then you get to the really small microscopic fauna, which I think this is a very illustrious group of people who actually know and appreciate these little, little, little critters. And we've seen a lot of them today already. So really the whole soil food web is to be considered when we are talking about soil health. And that's all I've got for, um, for today. I have maybe a few minutes for questions. I'll leave this up so you can contact me if you like. And this is our website. Thank you, Isabella. That was wonderful. Um, I think we have a few questions. We've been getting questions accumulated during the course here. There are a few specifically um, for you. And Raven's going to pull out any that were in the, the chat. I don't know if there were, but um, I guess the free roaming chickens came in before your talk. But since you mentioned that, um, let's maybe start with that one, and then I'll okay. hit, I'll pass it back to you, Raven. Chickens? I I can't see it. You see? Oh, oh, you can. You will have to read it to me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have two monitors. That's all right. I can I can read it to you. Um, <laughs> so, do free roaming chickens have any negative impacts on invertebrate health? Oh, okay. So that is a really big question. And I would say, <laughs> question, the answer is as often, if not always, it depends. So of course, the chicken that eats uh, the bugs out of the cow poop, that bug is negatively affected because it's eaten. Um, in general, I mean, I would say that if you have a, a good, healthy functioning ecosystem, then intervertebrates are part of that. And so while some will die, <laughs> others will live. I mean, that is the, the cycle of life. That is what we are after. We, you know, we, we are not after immortality here. That, that would be impossible. But um, to create a healthy cycling of nutrients, which invertebrates are a huge part of, that is what we're trying to do. So this is kind of a funny question, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I answered that correctly. What do you think, Stephanie? No, I, I agree that there's um it's not it's not black and white that they're entirely um advantageous or negative. It depends, right, on if you're the unlucky bug that gets eaten. Um there there can be again that that scratching and soil disturbance, but depending on if it's a really depleted soil and there's rest between when the chickens are there or not, that can be a good way to incorporate. Um, organic matter and manage weeds and other things like that. Exactly. So it does come back to management. It comes back to the how. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That was awesome. Um, Steph, do we want to move towards more of the general questions? Um, or does anyone else have any other specific questions on um, Isabel's presentation? So one specific for her is, um, can you please repeat the name of the article that examined pesticide effects on soil organisms? Yes. So it's on nmhealthysoil.org. And, oh, I'm go out of my presentation here. Um, on, it's online resource, and I think we will share these. It's called Pesticides Cause Widespread Harm to Soil Health. And it's on the NM Healthy Soil blog. Pesticides Cause Widespread Harm to Soil Health. Okay, I think that was, you're gonna type something in there. Thanks, Raven. Ah, thank you. <laughs> there it okay. is. Put the link in. Yeah, that? that would be really helpful. Yeah. And if you can put that, like type answer to that question in the Q&A and put the link in there. Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that. we have another specific question. Um, All right, go ahead. 
So this person is saying, I live near the coast in California and Baja. Has there been studies introducing worms to where they have not been before? To introducing worms? Study now. No, I'm not familiar with Baja necessarily, but I, I know that um, there have been some studies on, on, on earthworms and the fact that they're not native, but that would probably be something that, that Stephanie knows more about too. And I think I would just, I would clarify, I guess you're asking about studies about introducing worms to that area, correct? Because, um, yeah, specific studies about in California and Baja, I'm not aware of it off the top of my head, but we can follow up with that. That's something we've talked about a bit more um, kind of in the Great Lakes region, where a lot has been done about how introduced earthworms are negatively affecting organic matter and nutrient cycling and, and making forest floors um, too quote unquote clean. But I'll, I'll flag this one as a question we'll try to follow up with on in more detail in the email. Was, um, and then in the chat, we had something about dung beetles. Uh, okay, this is part of chicken. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to find it. I just lost it again. I've got it here. It's more um, adding comments to the question about chickens. So, for example, um, you know, if there's dung beetles, you monitor that and time when the chickens are allowed access to that area so that they're not negatively impacting dung beetles. If dung beetles are something, of course, that, that you see as beneficial and you want to promote them. Um, and then they say, on the other hand, if you've got fly larvae in that manure dung, then you want the chickens to have access to that area at that time to help manage those, those pest populations. 